I'm David. I'm a uh, nurse um, in Berlin working at Charité since uh, 2017 and I'm working on an oncology ward and I'm a, a spokesperson of the Berliner Krankenhausbewegung, the Berlin Hospital Movement and I'm also an elected representative of uh, my union which is Verdi. You can see like on the flag over there there's this Berliner Krankenhausbewegung and then this is the Verdi sign. It's a union maybe you can compare it to Unison here in the UK. Hi, I'm Lisa, uh, also a nurse at Charité. Um, I've still been in training during the hospital movement in 2021. Um, so quite fresh in the union, quite fresh in the job, but still, <laughs> you know, uh, been through a lot. Um, I've been in the negotiating committee as well as David and also a neglected spokesperson for the union and for the Berlin hospital movement. So um, first, we want to give you some uh, some details about the hospitals we're working in and the hospitals who took part in the uh, Berlin Hospital Movement. Uh, this uh, is uh, Charité and Vivantes. Charité is the second largest employer in Berlin, and Vivantes is the third largest employer in Berlin. And um, these are, these two are like uh, publicly owned uh, hospitals, and they are like responsible for around 50% of all the patients which are like uh, coming up in, in Berlin. Maybe you can go on to the next, perfect. So uh, the three contracts that we were fighting for um, were affecting like 15,000 hospital workers. Um, like the Berlin hospital movement, it consisted of 12 hospitals in Berlin. Uh, and in the end, we had to go on an indefinite strike for over a month, uh, and like we had four core demands and the four core demands were like safe nurse to patient ratios, sanctions if the nurse to patient ratios aren't met or weren't met. And the third one is better conditions for all our trainees. And the fourth one is um, uh, a pay raise uh, for all the outsourced workers at Vivantes. And like I have to go a little bit into detail um, regarding this. Um, so at Charité, there were all like all the nurses, but also like all the hospital workers uh, at Cathedral Lab, at Anesthesia, etc., etc. And at Vivantes, it were all the nurses, midwives, uh, but also all the cleaners, guys from transportation, from service, etc., etc. And we couldn't like bring in these kind of uh, professions at Charité because they had another contract, and we didn't manage to bring them in in this movement. Um, okay, so maybe we can. We can we come up or we came up with a uh, plan to win in 2021, which was was like over the time span for almost uh, like the complete year. And I have to go back to uh, 2015 because in Germany it's a little bit different, or it's the the history of striking for better working conditions in hospitals started in 2015 and it started at Charité. This was the first time that uh, nurses went on strike uh, for better working conditions and for safe nurse to patient ratios. And at this time, uh, back in 2015, it was also like also in our union, there was a huge discuss discussion about if nurses can go on strike with these demands, because before 2015, nurses only went on strike for like better pay. Uh, and then we like, con my colleagues, I wasn't working at Charity back then, so my colleagues, like they got in contact with lawyers and also with other politicians. And in the end, like uh, the union and my colleagues, they uh, decided and agreed upon going on strike, on, also on an indefinite strike in 2015 for seven days. And it was it had a huge impact. Um, uh, on the one hand, it had a huge impact on me because I was doing my training at this time. And I decided that after I'm done with my training, I have to go to Charité and join these fighting colleagues. And like, on the other hand, it was like, um, uh, like it was a starting point um, in Germany for hospital workers and especially nurses to go on strike for better working conditions. And um, referring to the strike at Charité, 20 other hospitals, um, uh, other university clinics went on strike, did campaigns for better staffing. So in like 20 other cities, like hospitals went on strike after 2015. And then in 2019, uh, we realized um, that like the contract we got in 2015, like it had these uh, regulations for the nurse to patient ratios, but it had no sanctions. So basically the bosses could do what they want because like we were said, yeah, you're not meeting the ratio, but there wasn't like no way of punishment if they weren't meeting the ratios. So we teamed up with our colleagues from Vivantes and we were like, okay, we have to find uh, like a new way. We have to pull up a new campaign. 
uh, to put as much pressure on our bosses as possible to get safe nurse to patient ratios and to have sanctions. And then, uh, luckily, we came upon Organizing for Power, uh, which is like a, um, an online lecture uh, or like an online, yeah, like an online training program led by the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, where um, Jane McAlevey and other organizers were like uh, pointing out specific organizing methods. Um, and we were like totally uh, blown away by that. And we like a, there was like a core group of around 10, 15 people from Vivantes, hospital workers from Vivantes and from Charité. And we were like watching these lectures together. And we were like uh, totally convinced that when we will pull off a campaign again, that we have to use these methods. And then of course, like 2020 pandemic hits, so everything got delayed, <laughs> but it gave us more time to come up with this plan. And then in 2020, uh, we developed this plan to win, uh, which basically, I already told you about the four core demands. And then we were like, okay, this will be, basically that's what the people want and like what our colleagues want, but how do we get there? Uh, and we, we got there with um, several structure tests uh, and we got there, um, of course, uh, with a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, and we got there in the end with like an indefinite strike. Um, uh, in 2021, this is a special situation in Berlin because we had um, federal elections coming up. Uh, so we voted for a new uh, mayor in Berlin. So we had one path, which was like uh, the path putting as much pressure on the bosses as we can. And then on the second path was putting as much pressure on the politicians as we can, because like the hospitals are publicly owned. So the politicians are also like uh, accountable, responsible for the working conditions in the hospitals. So uh, at the beginning of the year, um, we were like uh, approaching all hospital workers, not only the union members, but all hospital workers. And like, um, what's, bad about, uh, what's bad about your working conditions? Uh, which three things would you immediately change if you can? Uh, and what are you willing to do for it? And then of course, like a lot of people are saying like the, the worst thing is the bad staffing. Uh, and then we started with a signature petition. Uh, so when the people said like, yeah, we're, we're with you with these four core demands, then they signed uh, the signature petition. And as I told you before, it, like these contracts affect 15,000 uh, hospital workers, we got like 8,400 uh, signatures. So we had the majority achieved. And it was also like, like for us, uh, like hospital workers, but also union officials, it was like, uh, like the go sign, like the, okay, so now we're, we're good to go. And then we had this, you see this, we're coming to a bigger picture later. Uh, on the left, there's this huge signature petition and we handed it over. Um, in the morning, we handed it over to the, to the bosses of the hospitals. And in the afternoon, we handed it over to all the people who were running for mayor from the left party, the green party, SPD, etc. cetera. Um, so from that moment on, it was clear there's, this, um, yeah, there's these two pathways. Um, and the second structure test we did was um, because uh, like, we, the hospital workers, are the experts of our working conditions. So every unit, every ward had discussions and had to agree upon one specific uh, nurse to patient ratios. So cardiology had like talks in their team about the specific um, nurse to patient ratio. Nephrology had the same discussion going on. Oncology had the same discussion going on. And all like every ward had to agree upon one uh, nurse to patient ratio, which they think, they also did some scientific research, stuff like that, but this was also like what the people really think what they needed. Uh, and in this process, when they were done with this, they had to um, elect team delegates. So like one or two, two people who were like delegates of each ward. So because we brought these delegates then to the bargaining team and they were like responsible for giving all the information, all new information to their colleagues on the ward. Um, so this is the second structure test. Uh, and then after these were done, we were meeting, this is the, the picture in the middle, we were meeting at a big football stadium uh, in Berlin. It's uh, the stadium of Erste FC Union Berlin, which is like a football club, a leftist football club or something like that, yeah. Uh, and we will have a huge meeting there with 1,000 team delegates. And then like from then on, we were like, okay, we now have like the specific demands, like for every ward. Um, we, let, we can now hand these demands over to our bosses and also to the politicians. And this was like the next important step in the campaign. Um, and of course, like uh, during this time, we were all already like letting the bosses know that we are like, 
like really fighting hard for this uh, for these nurse to patient ratios. And then we had um, this is missing here, um, like a, a strike vote or like a, is it strike readiness vote maybe where we were all uh, again like um, talking to like every hospital worker and asking everyone, not only the union members, but everyone, are you ready to strike? And then of course, like we made the strike vote with the, uh, with the union members and you see like 98% were ready to strike and it's not only like to do a, like a three day warning strike, so to go on an indefinite strike. And our goal was, and we didn't uh, like uh, met that, um, to have these contracts done. At August, we were like already having some bargaining sessions. Uh, and in, in August, we started to realize that maybe we wouldn't like uh, get these contracts done uh, before the elections. Um, uh, so after the warning strike, we started to uh, go on an indefinite strike and this started before the elections. And then in the end, we had to strike like over a month, but then we won and we won really big. So this was long, sorry. And uh, just like, <laughs> I give it over to Lisa. Yeah, a bit more detail maybe, <laughs> was a lot of detail, but maybe more even. Um, so we wanted to do stuff differently than it traditionally was in unions. <laughs> uh, we wanted, instead of just a few representatives, I never <laughs> can never say that word, right? Um, that were negotiating for the whole clinic, we wanted the people themselves um, negotiating for their conditions. So what we wanted, or our goal was to find uh, at least one active colleague in each team, or as many active <laughs> colleagues as we could find um, by talking to as many people as we could really. So we didn't um, just you know, hand over the surveys uh, that David was speaking about, but we tried to have one-on-one -on -one conversations, appointments, um, that we took time for um, yeah, so that we could go in a uh, in a detailed talk about the conditions that the people needed. Um, yeah, so not only did we talk to as many members of the teams, the wards as we could, but we tried to focus on it's called um, OLID. So we tried to find one organic leader. Um, a person per team that the team trusted enough um, to you know, take a role as, for example, team delegate in the end, or that had the power um, to yeah, push the rest of the team into the whole uh, process before strike. And um, yeah, there you can see um, a bit more of the process uh, up on the left, that's my team, for example. Um, so, we have been working with um, instruments like team charts. Um, it's every member of the team puts down their name and then we highlighted the person, uh, the people that joined the union, we highlighted the people that um, took part in the majority petition or something like that. And the teams got really creative. They, um, yeah, they made these huge posters where they for example, the second picture, there's um, dots for people who took part in the majority petition um, and the dots um, down there, they're the new members of the union. Oh. So that everybody or the teams themselves could see their own process and kind of yeah, grew together. And um, people that were coming there from the outside could also see the process. Yeah, and then maybe we're gonna. Yeah, uh, I forgot about this, but then uh, thanks to the slides. <laughs> um, with the handover of the petitions to the bosses and also to the politicians, we kicked off a 100 days ultimatum. So this was like, okay, you have 100, you have 100 days left to fulfill our demands, and if you're not fulfilling our demands within 100 days, we're going an indefinite strike. <laughs> Um, and this is like what we told them, uh, like at Alexanderplatz in the center of Berlin, we told them the politicians. Yeah. And this was also like putting, it was, it was also like a key element because it was like on the one hand, it was important for the politicians and for the bosses, but it was also like super important for all our colleagues because we were always like telling them we have to get stronger. We have to build, we have to 
when there were maybe more members, we have to like grow more together. And like when days are getting more, and when there are less days going, then everyone's like, okay, so they, we're still not having our contract. Just negotiations are stuck. So the the possibility of an indefinite strike it got close, and everyone like realized that. Yeah, I told you about that before. This is like uh, some bigger photos of the hospital caucus. Yeah, and like maybe one one aspect to this one, uh, like as a principle of the whole of the whole campaign, we in every step, like we are like regular regular nurses, regular um, hospital workers. So we try to um, keep it or like keep it as democratic as possible. So every time when there was like some decision to make, we like brought in as many people as possible and had democratic votes. That's just like have a, like a small group of people like deciding for a lot of other people like what to do, what's the next step. Of course, there were some people like uh, doing some strategy and like um, working things out, but then it got like presented to like a lot of the members and then we had like straight democratic votes. And of course, this was like, this like also brought people like more to identify with the campaign and like to also like invest more energy in the campaign. Yeah, and then after these um, two structure tests and like the strike vote, um, the ultimate structure test is a long and strong strike. And I will take a little bit more time um, on this slide. Uh, you can see the numbers at Charité. We went on an indefinite strike for 32 days at Vivantes for 35 days. And at the outsourced workers, they went on strike for 42 days. And this is like an indefinite strike. But um, to give you some, some numbers on that, in Germany, you get around 70% uh, strike pay. Yeah, uh, per day, uh, and when you're like on an indefinite strike and you're having more than 21 days, it's 100% strike pay. But like in the as you probably know in the hospital, it's not like none of the nurses were able to go on strike for like 20 days. You can go on strike for three or four days, but then like staffing at the ward is so bad that you have to go in maybe for one or two days, and then you're going back out on strike um, because like maybe other colleagues who like were doing the shifts before, they're like, hey, I, w I want to go on strike too, and then like of course. Uh, like you, you're doing it like this. Um, and then what's um, also, you know about that, like uh, it's always like uh, difficult situations uh, doing a strike in a hospital. So uh, like the first thing, like the bosses tell you, the press is telling you, you're endangering your patients. Um, but then of course you're having these uh, safety staffing uh, negotiations. And then in the end, it turns out like staffing during the strike is maybe better than like regular staffing. Um, but in, in Germany, we like develop maybe a system or, or like a, yeah, like maybe a system how to, to, to deal with that problem. So it's, um, when there are no patients at the ward, it's easier for more, for more nurses or for more hospital workers uh, like to go on strike. So sometimes uh, we did like when we knew we had to go on an indefinite strike, like teams and wards, they had huge discussions, like how many beds can we shut down? And like during the strike, we managed to shut down 50 wards, like not over the, like over the whole period of time, but maybe for a week. Some of this, uh, the wards were closed for two weeks. And of course, you can't do that at an ICU or like uh, at an oncology ward, but you can do it with like eye ambulance or stuff like that. But this gave like also a huge boost like to all the colleagues when like a whole ward and a whole department is like shutting down. Um, yeah, maybe just let me check. <laughs> I think that's it for the strike. And then I hand it over to Lisa again. Maybe, ah. yeah, just one story about the strike, because it's like 32 days, 35 days, it gets exhausting. It gets, yeah, you get inse more insecure each and every day. And it's kind of demoralizing as well. And I had it, my worst moment, maybe on day 28, the negotiations, they kind of got stuck. You realized we probably aren't going to do it before the elections. And I didn't think it was going to be as good as we hoped. Um, and then a colleague from the I ambulance, uh, it, well, it was a ward. They didn't take part in anything before. They weren't active at all. And then on day 28, she came around and she was like, well, my whole team is standing out on the street we shut down our ward just now because we wanted to go on strike, all of us. So, um, yeah, that was pretty motivating for the, for the rest of the trip. <laughs> um, yeah. The political and community campaign, also very mo motivating throughout the whole process. Um, as David said before, we had these two rails, really. 
and it was building up power inside the hospital and putting pressure on the bosses and on the other side it was building um, power in the um, community or putting pressure on the politicians before the elections and <laughs> We got kind of, yeah, well, we annoyed the politicians, really. It was, we had their phone numbers. When I say we, it's uh, 30 to 40 people. Also, different wards, different units, midwives, um, physiotherapists, trainees, all of us annoying the politicians, calling them and meeting them at every public appointment they had um, and just making clear that it's us, we're not hiding anymore, us the people who you know, kind of saved <laughs> Berlin, saved Germany throughout the pandemic. Um, what are you going to do for us? And we were always holding them accountable for um, their decisions or making them responsible for a good um, health system. And um, what else did I want to say? Yeah, also maybe yeah what you've seen on the picture before was the demonstrations because they grew bigger and bigger every time actually and it was that's one of my favorite moments as well because it's you can see all these people usually not brave enough to you know speak up in the clinic mostly women in hospitals let's be honest um out on the street yeah loudly that was was a really empowering moment for me okay next Sorry. yeah the negotiations um, we tried to do that differently to the traditional negotiating process as well. Um, usually, as I said, it's for Verdi, it's like three or four representatives negotiating for all the workers, but not the workers themselves. Um, and what we did was to put as many members, as many workers in there as we could. So for Charité, it was 30 to 40 people, um, only in the negotiating committee. Um, different, yeah, jobs as uh, again nurses and so on. Um, and we were the ones negotiating for ourselves. And on top, um, we had the team delegates. Um, these were people elected in every team and every every ward, um, and they had three roles. The first one was communication. So everything the negotiating committee wanted to communicate into the clinic. Um, they were the, like the, the step in between and everything we had to know about their teams, they told us. So it was a communicating system. And then the second role was when the negotiations got stuck and we didn't know if we did the right thing for the clinic or if we you know, couldn't make, thought we couldn't make the right decision, then we went on, okay, well, that's probably the most important point about that. We had negotiating negotiations in one room and nearby in another room there were the team delegates all the time during the negotiations they occupied a cafeteria nearby they slept there they were there the whole time working on their demands working on you know posters or whatever um, so every time we got stuck or we just we got insecure we went we, we took a break told the bosses sorry time out <laughs> They hated that, really. They hated that we were so many in the negotiating committee, but they hated even more that there were more people in the room nearby that we could ask. Um, so, yeah. And then we had um, them vote. If we did not, went back and knew we did the right thing. And the third role was the team delegates are experts for their wards, experts for their own work. So. Yeah, when we didn't know if we were the right person or the right people to represent um, the world, we got Susanne from I Ambulance in and let her rent for an hour. Um, so, yeah. Can, Can, would you want to add something? Sure. Yeah, just one short thing uh, to point out this uh, very clearly. Uh, you said it, Lisa, like every time there was like some obstacle <laughs> in the negotiations or like there was, there was um, like we had to make a key decision, we took this break. And the bargaining team made some sort of wow that they would not go in a direction without uh, like um, talking this up with the team delegates. 
And every time then we took this break, we went to the team delegates and the team delegates made a vote. And it was like totally democratic and the bargaining team always went with the democratic vote of the team delegates. So this was also super important and sometimes this took a little bit because you know like we're talking about um, nurse to patient ratio in nephrology and then of course like there was maybe one team delegate from nephrology and then he texted like telegram or something like that like his other members and then we had to wait like until they responded so the bosses got more and more annoyed because this took some time but this was like super important because this brought everyone in you know like this was not only like some third party uh, doing negotiations for the workers is where the workers themselves doing the negotiations. Uh, and, another, yeah, and another thing is like um, we had like three, I think two or three sessions before, um, before going on the indefinite strike uh, negotiation sessions. And then like the bosses were like, we cannot do this as precise as you want to. We cannot give you the sanctions. Maybe we find like, some general solution for, for this problem, but no, it's not gonna happen as you want to. Um, and then, of course, like we told all the other workers, we had the strike vote and we like pulled off the indefinite strike. And then the bosses were like, okay, if, when you're on an indefinite strike, we stop negotiating. And of course, like after three or four days, uh, they called the union up and they were like, okay, we can meet up for talks. And we were like, okay, what do you want to do? Do you want to like meet up and talk or do you want to like meet up and continue with negotiating? And they like, they kept with the talk, but like in the end, it was negotiation. Uh, and this was also like super important because like on the one hand the bosses were always uh, telling us yeah but we already gave you this and that and then you have can you stop the indefinite strike and we were always like like and also some of our colleagues were like yeah but we're making progress but we knew um, that like when we will end the indefinite strike we will lose like the power on the um, on the bargaining table so like just to add this yeah just Maybe to, for you to get an image, oh, yeah. It, there was that one situation mm. in a very late point of the negotiations um, where our bosses told us it was over. We couldn't move on. Our demands are too detailed, too big. It's over. We can't go any further. And um, yeah, they kind of put the pressure on us that we should accept a not that good result or it was all just lost, gone. Um, and we went to the team delegates, super demoralized, and the team delegates were like, of course you're not taking that offer. We are not going to do that. It's, it was you know day 20 something and they still were like, no, we, we're staying on strike. And strike is exhausting. It's really, it's exhausting. The emergency staffing, it's really, bad for the, the people inside, so that's why the r rotating system was so important because yeah, emergency um, shifts are exhausting. So yeah, and they were like, no, we're going to stay on strike. So go back, tell them we're not going to do that. And that's what we did and yeah. Um, and another thing, the three rules went in the room. We had three rules uh, during the negotiations. It was. <laughs> First, poker face at all times. Really hard. <laughs> when your bosses are telling just, you know, well, it's ridiculous sometimes. And, and, but we yeah, tried. Uh, the second was no recordings, obviously. And the third was nobody speaks unless planned. So usually it's only a main negotiator. I think that's the regular negotiating system. We kind of did it differently again. Uh, we had a whole first row of negotiators which was us really, so yeah. Um, and we had, you know, we handed over like post-its or stuff, but everything we said was planned in a way, um, but it was not only the main um, negotiator, yeah. And then, victory. Yeah, uh, as, yeah, like we did it. <laughs> we managed to get three, um, these three contracts that we wanted. So we won one contract at, uh, these are all like, like after the last, these pictures were taken after the last bargaining sessions. So like at Charité, this is at uh, five in the morning after more than 20 hours of negotiating. Um, so um, yeah, we got this uh, contract at Charité uh, with the um, safe nurse to patient uh, staffing with the sanctions. We got this contract at Vivantes with uh, nurse to patient ratios and sanctions and we got the pay raise for the outsourced workers um, at Vivantes. And we doubled up uh, like our member, uh, our membership. This is like we won over 2,200 uh, new members. 
during this campaign. And so we also like convinced in a way our union that if you like do things differently, do it a little bit more radically maybe, <laughs> and like have a real plan to win for like a long period of time, you can actually achieve and have achieve a real big victory and have a contract that has like um, life changing, uh, like, like a life changing effect. Because right now it is like this, we have these um, nurse to patient ratios and if they're not, if they are not met, then we are getting days, paid days off. So like last year, like in my case, I got five, uh, five days off, but, they, but I got my total salary. So this is also like putting the bosses under pressure that they have to fulfill the nurse to patient ratios. And in the next year, like in the, in the first year, it's like every, every worker can have five, five days off. In the next year, it's every worker can have 10 days off. And in the third year, it's every worker can have 15 days off. And after the third year, it's like you can have as many days off as you're not meeting the ratios. So that's a big victory. And like the contract started in January last year. So we had this like for one year and we really like I can tell you guys it works. Like um, mm -hmm. it has a, really an effect on our working condition. Yeah. And that's what we need to talk about. Yes. Ah, okay. Sorry. Willst du? Yeah. Well, in my case, actually, I didn't get the days off because my team um, the primary nurse of my team or whatever. So she just decided that uh, the better way even mm. was to, you know, fulfill yeah, which the is great. ratio. So we weren't understaffed yeah. and that was great as well. Everybody wants to work in yeah. our unit now. It's, yeah, yeah it's, it's great really. Um, yeah, and maybe one last thing about the victory, I feel like what we learned is that we needed the indefinite strike to be that successful because only during the indefinite strike, mm -hmm. we were able to, you know, gain all these new skills to have the time because we were on strike to build up that kind of power. And um, yeah, also the trust in the colleagues that yeah. they then only saw that it was possible for them to be brave enough to maybe go outside, yeah, as well. And for the politicians and the bosses also to see, okay, it's not only the nurses that, you know, say, well, okay, it's, we're kind of ready or we're, how am I gonna say it? It's, I feel like it's, it's kind of new for women nurses, whatever, midwives to, to raise their voices and to say, we're not taking this any longer. Um, and, but an indefinite strike is the perfect proof. Yeah. I think. Soll ich das kurz machen? And this is just like uh, for you guys, um, the co-fundamentals from Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and Organizing for Power is like a follow-up to the sessions we did back in 2019. And it's again led by Jane McAlevey with another uh, bunch of organizers from all around the world. And it's an, like an online training ship and you can sign up for this and like um, have these lectures with organizers who also know about the Berliner Krankenhausbewegung but also about like many other big victories like take uh, like in the last couple of years for example like the Los Angeles teacher strike back in 2018 or 19. Um, so yeah just if you want to check it out like we learned a lot really a lot of this like this was like a, a key experience for us. So thank you for having us and thank you for listening. The emergency staffing, and I feel like that's pretty similar for the doctors. Um, we orientated um, on the weekend and the night shift staffing. So basically the lowest stuffing that we had on a regular day basis. Um, and that's, that was a, the, or the leg, legitimation. Legi legitimation or something. Legitim, <laughs> well, yeah. Sorry? That's how we legitimized. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because, um, I mean, as you know, it's the, like, we are working with bad staffing every single day. And so it must be possible during a strike mm -hmm. to um, work with the lowest possible staffing. Um, and we had a, we kind of had negotiations with our bosses 
beforehand. So uh, we told them that we would be willing to give that much stuffing per ward. Um, every ward told us what their minimal stuffings were. And then we told our bosses so that we can have, you know, um, an easy, a safe strike. They needed to cut down surgeries to um, emergency surgeries, not the elective program that they didn't have to do during a strike. Strike is a principal right in Germany. And we, I mean, you can't endanger patients if there are no, no patients. So the more people wanted to go out and strike in a team, the more beds they'd have to cut down. It wasn't possible at all times, obviously, but at least we tried and then we had a strike committee. There was, during the strike, the bosses were saying like, oh, we need two more people in the surgeon, surgeon, surgery room number one, whatever, and then we decided if it was necessary to, you know, um, for that person to go inside. Yeah. Um, and it worked, so, I mean, we even got a court injunction saying, is, is it all our bosses um, kind of tried to, you know, put repression on us um, or put down the strike with that court injunction saying, um, yeah, well, end of the story, maybe the court said it was um, our rights or we wouldn't, as nurses, ethically, we wouldn't endanger patients. So the... Um, emergency staffing that we were willing to give had to be enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, like uh, pulling off a hospital strike, it's all about tactics. When you're doing an indefinite strike, it's like uh, super, um, super decisive, like which ward, which department is taking, is pulling off a strong strike. If you're having like the guys from operation and uh, anesthesia pulling off a, a a strong strike, then there's like a big financial damage to the hospital. If you're having the guys from Cathedral Lab pulling off a strong strike, it's also like a big financial uh, damage to the hospital. So we tried like to push exactly these buttons. Um, and then to come to your questions, I think it's principally, it's basically it's the same in, in Germany, what happened in, in the UK with COVID. Like we had no PPE. Like, of course, people were clapping, but nothing changed. Like, to, make, to keep it short, I think it's exactly the same. Like, uh, politicians were making promises, but nothing happened. So, uh, and like in, in Germany, about, round about um, five or, or 6,000 nurses left the hospitals during the first year of COVID. So people really got frustrated and working under COVID um, or during the pandemic. Um, but in a way, um, this was also um, when the when the pandemic kicked in. We were trying, like, with no strike power, just like the union was trying in Berlin uh, to have some sort of um, COVID health deal with the government, just like to have uh, safe PPE stuff like that. And like the politicians, we were meeting, but they were, like in the end, like after three or four meetings, we realized, okay, this nothing's going to change. So we have to come up with a real plan. We have to put them under pressure. And so this was also like a story we could tell all the other colleagues. And all the other colleagues, they realized politics is doing nothing. So we have to move. So in a way, it gave us more motivation. It gave us a boost. Um, yeah, like what you said, I, it's just like I can like emphasize this. I think it's super important to identify these organic leaders in the teams. And often the organic leaders are the, are the, are the ones, that this, these are not the union activists. The organic leaders, these are people like, like when you come with a union flyer, they just leave me alone, yeah? Mm -hmm. But um, these are the people that you have to win over. Maybe it's not with one conversation. Maybe you have to like do four or five. Um, but like we won as many, uh, we won the most of the new members. We won uh, in the process of, um, after when every team got together um, to agree upon a demand. And then like these organic leaders, they realized um, this is some um, like to have really better working conditions. No one can do this for me. Like it's not my, uh, like, uh, like my boss at the ward, not like the bosses of the clinic. No one will do this for me if I like come up and say like, we need one to seven in the morning shift. No one's going, doing that for you, yeah, because it's, uh, obviously. Uh, and this was like the moment when we won over all these organic leaders, maybe not all of them, but like 
a couple of them, most of them. Um, and this was also like super interesting. Like for example, in my team, we had the team delegate, uh, we, had, we had the team meeting where we nominated the team delegates. And then like two of the people where I was like, one of them is like working there for 30, at, at this ward for 30 years. And, she, and she's kind of like the organic leader, obviously, because like everyone's coming to her when you're having like a specific problem. And I was like 100% sure she will not come to the meeting. And then she came to the meeting and she joined the, the union at the meeting. So this is really like what gets people going. And then to make it short, um, uh, what was happening? Ah, no, this was like the, the sorry, the negotiation methods. Yeah, um, um, to keep it short, and maybe you want to add something too, Lisa. Um, we tried to do it like in the beginning, our plan was to have like one big, open bargaining session like and have one contract uh, just one contract for Charité, Vivantes and the outsourced workers but then like when we started with negotiations like we realized okay we did, we aren't that powerful to pull this off or like to force our bosses to do this but then we managed to have like these like this huge um, uh, bargaining team from 30 to 40 people and we managed to have like all the team delegates there and the, we didn't broadcast, obviously, but what we did do is like, uh, like at the beginning, like when we had, we were finished with the, with the first bargaining session, we just like uh, printed, like printed a flyer, like just after the, and then we like spread out in the hospital and like brought this to every ward. And this is like um, what then when the, the, the bargaining process was going on, this is what like the role of the team delegates was all about. Like when there was any news of um, like negotiating, then like they were just like texting texting all the, the team members. Willst du noch was sagen? Nein. Okay. <laughs> then yeah. then just a talk about how you can use verbing in the negotiations Ah yeah, okay. That's not good. How did we convince Verdi? <laughs> um, I feel like that's actually maybe yeah, some points are the answer to the third question as well, to the groundwork. Mm before the campaign. So to convince Verdi, we also had to build up power in the hospital as well. So it was actually necessary yeah, for us to win over the, the union first, kind of. And so we had to show that there were not only um, members of the union kind of joining the union just so that they would get strike money during the strike, but to have active members that were taking an active part that were really interested in, you know, building a, a union group afterwards or that, you know, we kind of, yeah, I feel like what convinced Verdi the most was that it was a young, big group of people really, I don't know, wanting to change the union for the better as well and to be willing to yeah. um, stay in the union. And so then uh, to you, Mark, like how did we shut down the wards? Of course, like we had, when it was clearly to us in the warning strike that we had to pull off the indefinite strike, like we knew, okay, this team is like, or this ward is like 80% organized. So if a team is like 80% organized in the union, it's like, and it's um, according to, <laughs> what the, the ward is dealing with and it's possible then like uh, uh, the possibility that we can shut down this ward is like exceptionally high and of course like these uh, these colleagues they talked to their boss and said like we're all going on strike so you have like five days or seven days like to remove all the patients you can put them like you can book like appointments for them in the ambulances like and then of like the bosses get like oh they got scared and then uh, of course like management was also like uh, putting the bosses of the wards under pressure and then, but then when there were still patients at the ward, like we just sent in one nurse. And the nurse was like, in some cases, they were like really strong nurses. They, they were like doing shifts, one nurse for 18 patients. And then you say, hey, we want to shut down this ward. You have to remove all these patients. And then the next day, there was only one nurse again. And we told you yesterday, we want to shut down this ward. This, we're not giving you more than one nurse. And then we did this for three days. And then on the fourth day, the ward was shut. So, um, huh? Okay, so it's like it's not that you're like handing over some sort of paper and saying we're shutting down the the the. It's like again, like people on the ground floor, uh, like doing this, like a really pretty exhausting but like necessary work to shut down a wall. Um, sorry, you want to say? 
Yeah, I just wanted to say that, it, I mean, even if it's not possible to shut down beds or to shut down the wards, mm -hmm. for example, for the ICUs or for emergency room or for, you know, the midwives, um, they still had a team process. They still mm -hmm. had these team meetings every week, coming up with other creative ideas like um, Aleda, which they all signed the complete mm. team saying, if you aren't, if we aren't getting our demands, then we're going to drop out collectively or something like that. So it was, there was other ways to put on pressure on um, not only shutting down wards because you can't do that in every single ward. It's not possible. Yeah. Um, then regarding the demands, this was one of the core demands to get these sanctions, maybe to get a little bit more into detail. Um, like when, the, like when the, the ratio is not met, like all the, all the hospital workers in this shift, not only the nurses, but also like the guys from service, um, I don't know what's it called, like the, the nursing assistants maybe, they're also getting these days off. So like when they are taking the, when we are taking the days off, like hospital has to pay us the salary, but they also have to manage to get more people like maybe have in Germany it's leasing. I don't know, like uh, like nurses from the outside to bring in the hospital. So this costs them super much money. So they are not interested in like giving us these days off. So this and, and it's as it is accumulating it, like it puts more and more pressure uh, on the bosses and uh, on management of the hospital. So and. Like, as I said before, like after one year, we really, we know that this works. Like in, in, in Berlin at Charité, it, it really works. Um, did COVID had an effect was the other question. Um, yeah, of course, like management was always telling us like, <laughs> you cannot do this. We're in the midst of a pandemic, uh, you're endangering patients. But I would say in the end, it wasn't that, because like most of the, most of the, the, the main part of the campaign, it took place in summer. So we had like tons of meetings outside and of course it was pretty difficult like for other people to come in the hospital so we had 30 organizers in berlin in this campaign and like maybe three organizers for each hospital and of course this was like pretty difficult to bring in the organizers in the hospital but we don't have like like you we don't have like an, a union office in the hospital it's not like what it's like in germany um so this was like this was an obstacle but like we meant we, we we got to manage that one um uh, yeah, and I think that's it for, and then I hand it over to you. Yeah, uh, to your questions, uh, the different number of strike days, that's quite an interesting question. So indefinite means indefinite, we didn't have an idea how long it's, it would take. And um, in Nordrhein-Westfalen, a big region in Germany, they went on strike the year after. Oh, like, yeah, And they were on strike for 77 days in a hospital difference was it wasn't for us it was three different contracts in the end for them it was six university clinics one contract in the end so six bosses having to you know <laughs> fight it out um so that's why it took them so long but yeah so we didn't know how long it would take tough was for the vivantes outsourced it took them the longest but the nurses weren't allowed to strike along then anymore because we had our contracts already so the pressure, you know, that was, we need yeah. to do that differently next time. Um, yeah, that was a problem, I feel like. And the other question was bargaining in different groups. So how did we get to similar results? Um, that was part of the tactic again, because the Charité Hospital, we have a, our boss, and that, that's where we got lucky, is a bit more on the modern side. So she kind of... At some point, she, we knew that she was ready to reform the health system with us somehow. She, I mean, you know. Uh, whereas Vivantes has a really, really tough boss. So we knew that they wouldn't come to results in any way. But then Charité went or did the first step, and then Vivantes said, they got that already, so we need that as well, because otherwise, all of our colleagues will move to Charité. So that was kind of, you know, yeah, and um, we used that pretty well as a tactic, Yeah, I feel like. Okay, so quick answer to the first question. Um, we had 30 organizers in Berlin, um, and well, the, the number of organizers um, was anticipated by the, or we were anticipating um, the number of new members 
and therefore we got the organizers. Like, yeah. Then in NRW, Nordrhein-Westfalen, we already had 70 or 60 organizers, like double the number, but then again, more members were gained. Um, and I was an organizer myself, for example, so, uh, so after I was an active worker, an active member of the union, I decided myself to be an organizer in the next round. So sustainability, yes, I would say. Um, and what, well, the whole timeline that David presented, it was an, um, well, so many of us took an active part in the whole process. So we didn't just join the union for the strike money or the strike funding or something like that. No, just we, we joined the union to play an active part and we still, we're still doing that. So it's kind of like, yeah, I, I feel like we didn't drop out afterwards because we knew that we could go further on and we realize it now. It's, um, we're now, um, well, first strike day is, is Friday actually for pay rise this time. And we didn't need 30 organizers. We're, I think it's three organizers now because we're only calling our team delegates and it functions. It's only one call away and, you know, kind of a, a self-running system. So, yeah, it's, it is sustainable, definitely. I would say so. Yeah. Uh, and then just like a short answer to you, how much do we have to compromise on the ratios? Um, yeah, we, we did have to compromise, yeah. Um, uh, in, in Germany, it's like a, uh, we don't have, you have two shifts. Now you're working the morning shift and the night shift or like the day shift and the night shift, sorry. And we have like, uh, like a morning shift, an afternoon shift and a night shift. So it's uh, eight hours. Uh, and we get pretty good ratios uh, for the morning and for the afternoon shifts, but the ratios that we got for the night shifts, they aren't that good. And, but then in, on the other hand, like we get pretty good results when we had like, for example, oncology, like, or maybe like other, like other, like cardiology, like they were pretty strong, like showing up. The team delegates were always there. And then when we had to compromise, we were like, like, oh, we had the vote with the team delegates. But when they were like, of course, like a lot of people from cardiology, then we got like better ratios with cardiology than maybe with nephrology when nobody from nephrology was there. So this is like the like we got the best results when people got involved, when people showed up. And that's the way it worked. Like, yeah. No. No. <laughs> I think, yeah, like we talked about this or we said this before. Uh, that, like, it was like an experience of a lifetime to do this like this, and it's not like that, that we did it, but like to see really colleagues who, who weren't involved at all uh, before this campaign, joining the campaign, winning people over, like uh, identifying organic leaders who weren't like part of this at all, and then like uh, winning this big, and like, oh, like we're ready uh, from Berliner Krankenhaus for more exchange, like maybe in one-on-one -on -one conversations after this one, or like uh, we can exchange contacts and like have Zoom meetings or stuff like that. So yeah, let's keep up the good struggle. <laughs> I think that's enough. Yeah, maybe one last thing from me as well. Because um, I feel like, you know, going on strike in an understaffed hospital, it seems impossible. Mm -hmm. And for me, showing that it was possible made me realize that it was possible for me to stay in the job even. Because it's like, you know, all the anger, all the frustration, it, it's only, yeah, I don't know, we need a perspective to stay in the job, I feel like. And um, the strike and the, what we are doing now is giving me the hope to be able to do my job for a few more years or even Forever. <laughs> Forever, but uh, yeah, I didn't have that pers perspective before. And I was only in training and mm. knowing, is it, you know, uh, completely demoralized. So, yeah, I feel like it's, uh, the union work is what's keeping me in healthcare. So that's cool. <laughs>